So, good afternoon, and uh, it's a great honor to come here. No one's ever asked me to talk about Turing before. Uh, I didn't know much about Turing until really the last six months when I learned a great deal more about it. Um, I had read his, uh, the book by David Hod uh, Andrew Hodges, which came out in the early 80s. Uh, and it's probably still the best book uh, about Turing that you can get. But uh, of course, with all the excitement that mounted around the ACM centenary uh, celebrations, uh, I read a little more, I went and talked to people, and uh, let me tell you what, what I find, found out. So, everyone knows he was born 100 years ago. Uh, the ACM, uh, the Wikipedia website has sort of some additional information which may or may not be relevant to that. Uh, his parents were in Urissa in a place called uh, Ganjam. And then, uh, as was fairly normal in those days, his, uh, they went back to England, or his mother went back to England when he was expected. And uh, he was actually born in, in London. Uh, the event took place from the 14th and 15th of uh, uh, June, and uh, Anand was there, I was there, and a few others from India were there. Uh, and uh, the last line I think is important. It's we are, of course, very pleased that the assistant is uh, celebrating this function, but I think in a more fundamental way, if there had been no Turing, there probably would have been no persistent, and what we call the Indian software industry would have been something very different. Uh, in fact, the whole computing industry would have been very different. So, he really is the, way, the reason we are here today, quite apart from the generosity of persistent in, uh, in hosting this event. That's... Uh, a photograph of, uh, of a sculpture that there is in a London park about Alan Turing. Uh, he looks uh, rather serious, sitting there, thinking, uh, I mean, new theorems, new ideas, something going on. But I was very pleased to see that the persistent website has probably about the only smiling photograph of uh, Turing that I've seen. Anyway. And, uh, I, I hope it's real, because uh, I'll tell you why later. So Turing, uh, everyone knows, he, he led the way. He invented a simple abstract computing machine. He uh, really redefined the way computability and uh, decidability could be defined, uh, could be uh, thought about. He showed that a universal Turing machine could compute any computable function. Uh, it's it's called a, a, a thesis. It's, it's not a it's not a theorem because we don't know what uh, or what the set of all computable functions uh, is. But we know that if a function is computable, then it's computable on the Turing machine. Uh, and more than that, he gave a computational view of many problems. Uh, and you must imagine that you're in a, in a world where mathematicians and physicists rule everything. Not very different from today, but uh, perhaps even more so than today. And uh, to go against that and to give a completely different way of understanding uh, many problems was, I think, really quite remarkable and, and probably one of Turing's uh, most outstanding achievements. He had all sorts of interests, um, and I'll talk a bit about some of them later on. He was interested in statistical methods for code breaking, uh, and of course, this is what he was best known for. Uh, whenever you hear the word code breaker, you imagine you will see uh, a photograph of Turing somewhere there. Uh, he worked on artificial intelligence, as that uh, video clip showed. Uh, he worked on chess playing programs, computer <coughs> design, formal program proofs. He worked on biology. He, in fact, he was working on that uh, towards the end of his life, uh, on morphogenesis, uh, trying to get a model for how cells differentiate. Uh, so he, he, he didn't stop at any boundaries. He didn't say that this is my discipline, I'll draw a circle around it and I'll stay comfortably within that, whatever interested him, you know, he got passionate about, and he would spend time. Uh, and uh, quite remarkably, he made fundamental differences uh, in all these areas. Now, going back even more to his school days, his, uh, his headmaster complained about him and said, uh, he must aim at becoming educated. If he's solely to be a scientific specialist, he's wasting his time in public school. 
Now, the idea of getting educated was that uh, he should learn Greek and Latin, he should learn the classics, he should be well versed with uh, literature, music, art, everything else, and he should, of course, do some mathematics and, uh, and physics and so on. But uh, Turing's focus was somewhere else. He, he knew what he wanted to do. Uh, he didn't really care if people called him a scientific specialist or a mathematician or anything else. He knew what he wanted to do, and that's what he uh, went and did. Uh, as you know, he ran marathons. Uh, and it's interesting, he was not just a marathon runner, as uh, many people are today, but at that time, he was only 11 seconds slower than the Olympic winner. Uh, the time was quite, quite long. In those days, uh, 2 hours and 46 minutes was, was the winning time. Uh, so, sorry, 2 hours, 46, well, 45 minutes and something was the winning time. He did, he took a little longer than that. He took 11 seconds longer. So he's a serious runner. And uh, there are stories about how he was, when he had nothing to do, or when he wanted to uh, sort of get a release from this heavy mental activity, he went for a run. And uh, he occasionally came across um, small club groups who were running somewhere. And they would ask him which club he was in. And he never answered that question. He just ran on and went on from there. Uh, he sometimes even ran 40 miles to London for a meeting. So get up in the morning, <laughs> run to London, attend the meeting, and come back which uh, tells you something about uh, both his physical energy uh, and his, his willingness to use it. Uh, the clip also had something about computability, about Turing machines, and everyone knows roughly what uh, a Turing machine is. It's a machine that has uh, an internal state. Mathematicians don't like this idea of internal state. Uh, that's sort of corrupting. It's suggesting that somewhere your putting a machine into something that should be pure and beautiful mathematics. There's a head that can read and write uh, one cell, and a tape can move one cell left or right. The tape has a beginning, but no end. It's inf infinitely long. And the next state and action depend on the current state. Uh, and this is all that he wanted. This, this is purely an abstract uh, conception. He does not need to have a tape. I mean, you didn't have to actually have a tape, you didn't have, need to have a head. You could think about this purely abstractly, mathematically, uh, and the whole thing would work. And he used this to prove uh, some basic properties about computability. Uh, any computable problem can be computed by a Turing machine, about decidability, and one of the interesting uh, aspects of decidability is the halting problem, that given any program, uh, and any input to the program, will the program eventually stop when given that input? And this is a classic example of an undecidable program. And there are many other such. All this was done in Cambridge before Turing did his PhD. So in some ways you could describe this as the, the most uh, outstanding uh, undergraduate um, project that anyone has even thought about. Quite remarkable. So there he was at 22 doing this kind of work. Uh, he got, into, got in touch with Max Newman, and Max Newman was impressed by what he did. Uh, Max Newman knew about the work that was happening in, uh, in the United States with uh, Alonzo Church on proving computability uh, using recursive function theory, lambda calculus, and so on, sort of heavy mathematics. Um, and he saw that Turing had got the same results very elegantly. Now clearly, um, you couldn't have a, a, a transatlantic telephone call in those days unless you were a prime minister or a head of state or something. So he suggested to Turing that he should go and work with Church in Princeton. And Church then was an associate professor there. So now you can imagine this 24-year-old, no PhD, going and talking to somebody who's an established mathematician who has uh, proved the same results using fairly standard mathematical theory, because of function theory, lambda calculus, and so on. Uh, and this young man, no PhD, comes in on a boat from Cambridge, goes up to him and says, uh, I think I can do that better. Uh, not many people would do that today or any other day. 
uh, during the date. Um, church had to accept that uh, this was uh, a perfectly valid thing. Um, and Turing showed that it was much simpler to do it using the abstract Turing machine. And this is why these results uh, are now, this result is now called uh, the Church Turing uh, thesis. Uh, from uh, the discussions during the ACM uh, centenary, it became clear that uh, Church was very keen that Turing should work everything out in detail and in full formal rigor. Turing didn't like that. He somehow didn't have the patience for all of this. He, he knew what he had. He knew it was mathematically sound. He didn't see why he should, he should sit there and, and labor. But Turing wanted a PhD, and Church was uh, his supervisor. So he had to do it. But generally speaking, it appears that Turing was never very happy in Princeton. Uh, he, was, he felt he was being constrained too much. He had a, a, a more active mind, and he was being tied down, saying, you know, these details, you haven't filled this up, you haven't done this. He got his PhD in Princeton in 1938, and when he'd done that, he came back to Cambridge, he was there for a little bit, and uh, so Turing's contribution up to that point was a mathematical basis for computing, but something that was much more intuitively understanding. Uh, I don't know how many people have done recursive function theory. I tried once. Uh, it's mathematically fairly stolid stuff. It's uh, not the kind of thing you would use for right, light reading. You would devote months to understand it. You would spend even more months trying to understand what it was achieving. So you had to be a solid mathematician to do it. A Turing machine, you could almost explain to any programmer. They may not understand everything about it. Uh, any program, any mathematician, really, you could explain this to and say this is, uh, it's intuitively so much more attractive. So, um, Turing had gone to Princeton on the advice of Max Newman. Uh, he came back to Cambridge, not quite sure what he was going to do there. Uh, Turing didn't get on very well with, with people. He, he was fairly individual and uh, probably a bit abrasive, uh, probably a bit impatient. Uh, so he was rattling around in Cambridge, and by then, uh, this group had been set up in, in Bletchley, Bletchley Park, for code analysis. So Max Newman was there, and he suggested that Turing should come to Bletchley. Uh, he soon it became leader of the cryptanalysis work, um, and uh, the first task was to decipher the messages that the German uh, army used using their uh, Enigma machines. Uh, these were encoding machines which were more complex really than anything that the Allies had. Uh, and the naval Enigma was even more complex, and it became very critical to uh, crack the naval enigma process because uh, the Allies were losing a lot of ships across the Atlantic uh, because they were being attacked by German uh, U boats. So it became really vital, and uh, Turing led this effort. How did he lead it? Nobody appointed him to be leader of cryptanalysis. I think he just went there and did things. And it soon became clear that he could think more clearly and do things more effectively than most other people and people naturally followed him. So he was a, a leader in that sense just by uh, standing up in front and doing things. Um, he used a lot of statistical methods, but uh, he also used a lot of mechanical aids. And you've heard the mention of the, of the bomb, uh, which is a smallish device. There was also the Colossus. It was called a Colossus because it was very big. And all these were used to reduce the statistical probabilities in trying to crack this code. Uh, the code, the Enigma code was changed every day. So it was not enough to know how the machine worked. You had to know what the code of that day was, because like all this information, it was dated. You wait three days and that information is no use anymore. Uh, human analysis was still very, very critical. You couldn't do this by machine. Uh, and uh, you had to have some notion of the possible content. And one of the sketches you saw on that little clip showed you how crypt analyzers were marking bits of the text uh, and suggesting that it could be this, it could be that. What they wanted really was to get a phrase, a word, something that they could uh, uh, 
you know, decrypt. Once they got that, that gave them a hint about the key. And uh, they knew what the previous keys were like. So imagine your, your, your old crypt analyzers um, you know, working on, on uh, using the Naval Enigma machine. And every day you have to produce a new key, uh, a new password. Uh, if the same person does it, it's very likely that someone sitting uh, nearby will begin to understand the pattern that the person uses. Once they run through their birthdays and their family birthdays and uh, their uncle's names and their mother's maiden names and all the traditional things that people use, uh, there will still be some pattern to it uh, every day to produce a new key. And the Allies became quite good at, at uh, figuring out what the pattern was. And they discovered, of course, that the key was very often one of the German encryptor's girlfriend's names. So this would appear once in a while. So once you got a key, you could try it out. And these statistical machines were very useful for that. So just to reduce the possibilities. And Turing uh, was active in all of this. Not just the machines, but also in the way that the human beings organized themselves. And it was big. It was a big team. It wasn't a small number. Uh, there were huge teams. I think there were thousands of people working on this uh, in shifts because you had to do this day and night, and each of them had a task and they had to put it together. They uh, relied on Turing for new methods. Uh, whenever they were stuck, Turing had to find some way of, of cracking this. Uh, and Turing worked whenever he wanted to, which is most of the time. But he also suffered from hay fever, and uh, which meant that in the summer he had, uh, he had a problem with all this pollen in the air. And, uh, he would sometimes come to work in his pajamas, uh, but wearing a gas mask. And it's not a very good image. Uh, but let me warn you, I think this image is, is actually a fake, which must have been posed much later. If you look at that building, I clipped it, but if you look at that building, that building was not, didn't exist in, uh, in the 1940s. It was definitely much, uh, much later than that. But still, you get an idea of what he looked like, pajamas, <laughs> jacket, mask. Completely unconcerned with what he looked like, he would turn up there. If he was bored during the day, he would put the same uniform on and, and you know, cycle around Bletchley Park. So he was a familiar figure doing that. When the war was over, Turing moved to Manchester. He worked on computer design, artificial intelligence, <coughs> verification finally, as I said, on morphogenesis. Uh, today, the reason for his death is not, uh, not very certain. Um, in 1992, I think the BBC felt that, it, it was probably felt that he had committed suicide, that he injected um, an apple with cyanide and ate it. Today, it's not clear that that was the case, because he used to do experiments with cyanide also. And it may have been just by accident that he was not careful enough and he inhaled a lot of cyanide fumes, uh, or somehow contaminated something that he was using and ingested this. Uh, so I think that will remain another mystery about Turing. So Anand talked about algorithms and complexity, uh, and uh, I was reading something about this uh, a long time back. Uh, and of course, algorithms are known from, from the time of the Greeks. There's Euclid's famous algorithm. But more recently, I discovered that algorithms were used in Indian mathematics quite a lot. Uh, Kerala mathematicians in the 15th, 16th century who were busy with calculus, uh, they, used, they had algorithms, but they tended to use recursive algorithms, um, and, uh, which are a little harder to understand and explain. Move forward uh, another 200 years or so, and uh, there's um, Lamy's theorem, uh, which puts a limit on the number of steps that Euclid's algorithm takes. And this limit is interesting because there is some amount and it says that it will not take any more steps than that. So it's like an upper bound. And, and there's a long history of interest in, in complexity. How difficult is, is it to solve a problem? Uh, and I've mentioned some of the names there uh, and you find Turing at the end of this, not because he was the last, but because the list is sort of goes on and on. But by the 1960s, um, attention was getting more and more focused 
and uh, Yamaha, My Hills, Malin, Cobham, Ed Ed Edmonds, all started to, I think, narrow down the whole field and get closer towards the solution. So the basic problem is, uh, can all computable problems be solved equally easily? Um, and uh, Hartmanns and Stearns in 1965 published their famous paper when they formally quantified the time and space of a computation. And they did that in terms of a Turing machine. Uh, time is the number uh, of steps that, uh, that uh, a tape moves. And space is the number of cells on the tape that are used. Um, and I talked to Hartmanis and I said, uh, you know, what, what would you have done if there had been no Turing? And he dismissed that and said, you know, what would physics have been like if there was no Einstein? So I said, no, you know, I, I, it's not exactly the same because the results of computability and decidability were known uh, at the time that Turing proved them again for um, uh, using the Turing machine. So they were not unknown. It's just that the measures would have been very different. And he said that they struggled with mathematics, using recursive function theory, lambda calculus, everything else, and then came across Turing machines. They were mathematicians. Uh, Hartmanis had done his PhD in uh, Caltech, moved to Cornell, he was in the maths department, and then he moved to uh, GE Research in Schenectady, and Stearns joined uh, a little later. And uh, so they came with a very mathematical background, but they were fascinated by the problems in computing. And they therefore used mathematical techniques. Uh, and he said that when they came across Turing machines, they found it made it so simple. He keeps saying, so simple. None of the mathematics that we, that we used uh, was necessary anymore. Hartmanis, of course, got uh, Turing Award for it. Somewhat late, I think he got it in 19... Hartmanis and Stearns got their Turing Award in 1993. The work was actually done in, published in 1965. And that developed into the classes of precision problems, uh, P and NP that, that we had said about. Um, so, just two things stuck in my mind uh, uh, earlier this year. And this was uh, you know, time, we talk about the number of steps that uh, the Turing machine takes, and space in terms of the number of cells of the tape that I use. If there'd be no Turing machines, what measures would have been used for uh, complexity? And that's hard to say. Uh, we can only say that people don't hang around. Uh, something would have evolved, but uh, it probably would have taken much, much longer to find, been harder to understand, and probably of less practical use. Today, any student of computer science talks about the order of an algorithm as being n, n squared, exponential, logarithmic. Uh, you don't do uh, a, you don't use a, a bubble sort, not just because uh, you know it takes a long time, but because you know the order of a bubble sort uh, is much higher than the order of many of the linear sorts that are available. The Turing Award started in 1996, and one of the questions during the centenary was, uh, Turing wasn't that well known in '66. Uh, what made ACM talk about uh, Turing Awards? Why not somebody else, uh, some other name? Uh, no one had an answer to that, uh, but generally, probably, I just felt that uh, it could be that there was a great deal of interest in artificial intelligence in the late '60s, and uh, Turing's paper, the Turing test, had acquired a lot of. Um, visibility then. And it was probably a combination of these that led to people talking about um, the Turing Award. 66 is just one year after um, you know, the paper from Hartmanis and Stearns. So that cannot have influenced things so substantially, uh, so quickly. But so this is a strong suspicion is that it was the fact that um, artificial intelligence and the Turing test seemed to come together. There were 32 past winners at this function, never to, to be repeated again. Uh, many of the oldest uh, winners have died. Many of the more recent winners have died. Um, Charles Buckman, I think, was the oldest one there. 
from 1973, oldest in the sense that his Turing Award was the oldest. The oldest person there was probably Gottlieb, who was 91, and he used to climb up and down the stage very comfortably. Uh, not all the Turing Award winners were quite as, as mobile as he was. Uh, then, so 73 was uh, Bachmann, 74 was Knuth's, and everyone's heard of Knuth's, at least from his books uh, and his papers. Uh, and an interesting, there was a, a theory session, uh, or a, a session with several theoreticians there, and people were asked, uh, do you think it will be proved that P equals NP or P not equal to NP? And uh, most of the people said, well, it will be proved that P not equal to NP, but it will take 10, 20, 30 years. No one knows. And Knuth stood up and said, no, I don't think that's the case. I think it will be shown that P equals NP. But uh, it will be a much harder problem to decide after that. So he was the only one who stood out there and said this. And uh, we have to find out whether uh, that is the case. ACM India did uh, a wonderful thing, nothing to do with me. Uh, this was really Peter Narayanan's uh, idea, to sponsor two PhD students to attend the Turing uh, Centenary event. Uh, and one was from IIT Bombay, and the other was from uh, CMI in uh, Chennai Mathematical Institute. They both went there. Um, they had a great time listening to the lectures, being photographed next to uh, Turing Award winners, um, and uh, Abhishek is writing a, an account of uh, um, his impressions uh, after attending the session. You'll find a, a short version of that will come out in the uh, ACM India newsletter, which is mailed out to everybody. Uh, but there's a longer version of it, which tells you much more about this, some of the things that I've said, um, and uh, many more things, his own impressions, what he discovered. And he will also tell you more about Dana Scott's uh, comment that he thought that it would be proved that P equals NP, but that wouldn't make anything any easier. Um, Turing Award winners, it makes it sound as if uh, they're very distant, they're very eminent, uh, they are somewhere out in another galaxy. But in fact, of course, uh, many of them have been to India, and I tried to make a list of the ones that I knew of. I'm sure the list is incomplete, there will have been others who came, but um, Morris Wilkes certainly came here in the 1970s. He lectured at the TIFR when I was there. John McCarthy came even earlier, uh, probably in the late 60s. He came, he had long hair, looked uh, very much like a hippie, and he was, uh, he came, he lectured at the uh, TIFR at that stage. Uh, Tony Hoare came in 1978. Hopcroft uh, uh, came in the 70s, I don't know exactly when. Milner came in 1981. Uh, Lamson came, uh, the ones with the star are the ones that I know of who came to Pune and lectured here. So Lamson came uh, not that long ago, probably five years ago. Uh, Hartmann has came to India in 1966, lectured at the TIFR, but on switching theory. He didn't talk about uh, his new result in complexity. I asked him why once, and he said, well, nobody was interested. Um, and uh, so that was a comment about the fact that in those days, the importance of complexity theory was not really that visible to people, even in the theory community. It acquired momentum later. Uh, Raj Reddy is a regular visitor. Amit Pranelli came, uh, lectured at uh, the TRDDC several times. Joseph Stefakis had been to TRDDC several times, lectured. I think he also gave a CSI lecture once. Uh, Barbara Liskov came to Bangalore and talked uh, about her work. And uh, last year, Charles Tucker came. And at that stage, he was the most recent Turing Award winner. Uh, and uh, he came and talked about his work. So there's been a stream of them. There are probably a few more. If you know of any who, who have come, please let me know. It would be fascinating to find out. So, finally, Turing was 42 when he died. And... Uh, Nobody has any idea what he would have been doing if he had lived longer. He'd switched his interest from uh, mathematics to computing, from computing to cryptanalysis, from cryptanalysis to artificial intelligence. Um, he designed the ACE machine, but again by general 
consensus. He was not a very good engineer. He kept changing designs. You know, and engineers like to have a design that they work on, which they're going to implement. So every two days, children would go and change the design somehow. So the ACE was not built during his time at the National Physical Laboratory, but um, it was built later. It was built later, in fact, after Turing had moved away, when the design could not be changed anymore. But uh, he was impatient. If he thought of a better way of doing something, he would change it. Um, and I'm sure that must have made uh, engineers rather uh, frustrated. A truly remarkable mind. Um, he was a mathematician, scientist, engineer, and 100% genius. Uh, quite unusual. Um, he would have been 100 this year. He showed the world uh, how to look forward. He gave computing very secure foundations. As I said, we're here today because Turing existed. And he showed that many problems have a computational basis. And we're still discovering some of that today, especially in biology. Great interest in uh, <coughs> biology and computing today goes back to the 1950s. And Turing was the first to think of it that way. If he had lived, what, had been, what would he have been working on today? Very hard to say. Uh, and that is outside the house uh, in Manchester where he, he lived um, and uh, where he actually died. So let me stop there. Thank you once again. Uh, I hope if I've done nothing else, I've uh, encouraged you to go to the ACM site, find out more about Turing, uh, go to some of the sources. The book by Andrew Hodges is very good. There have been lots of other things. Um, there was a, a, a documentary that he was shown in San Francisco, and there's hope that someday that will also come on television here. It's been released once in the UK, uh, and they're hoping for a wider release after that. Uh, that's more about during, uh, during his personal life, uh, and so on. So uh, it's well worth reading about him. A patient man, couldn't sit still. If he had nothing to do, he would run a marathon, or he'd cycle around wearing his gas mask. Uh, he came up with all these ideas. Really, he came at a time when the world needed him, and the world was not ready for him. This will keep happening. There will be other Turing's. And we must uh, at least be aware that uh, we need to step aside and give them space uh, to grow. Thank you. actually tap you again for one of the more serious lectures on one of the speakers as well. Uh, with this, let me now hand it to the group to show us the 45-minute film that we have, that we got from BBC Television. And after this film, we'll have a short 20-minute break, and then follow up with Vivek Kulkarni talking about uh, the work of Alan Turing. I think the, uh, the centers should uh, disconnect and run their own film and just to let you know, we are actually video casting this in our centers in Hyderabad and Nagpur and Goa. So they are sitting in other conference rooms watching this. So we have to keep sending these. Thank you. 